that we can have in the midst of chaos. Well, this morning, I'm going to start a little bit different. Um, I, I don't know. I don't like to embarrass people. And so, because these people aren't here, I don't think I'm going to embarrass them. And if they blush, they're just blushing at home. So, but I want to say something about some people, and I want to encourage you when you have a chance to affirm them. Because they're doing great service to our church. And first is Marty. I'll tell you, Marty is so committed to evangelism. He is so committed to the ministries of our church here. That man does a lot. He does a lot for us. And if you haven't shared your appreciation with him lately, I would encourage you to do it. It can even be today a text. Well, forget a text. <laughs> um, I've tried that. <laughs> um, I don't know how much he sees them. Better would be a, a call or just say something to him in person. Let him know you appreciate his ministry. We all can use encouragement, can't we? And Jean, um, all these people are sick or were exposed to people. <laughs> That's why they're not here. But it's a big job to be treasurer of a church. That's a huge task, and not many people are willing to take it. And Jean in spite of not having an experience in it, she was willing to step forward. And she's been doing such a good job. You wouldn't know she doesn't have experience. She's doing a great job. And it wasn't easy to get started. It was a little harder than normal to get started. And she stuck with it. And Darlene has been her assistant. And very faithful and so committed, so much time so much time getting trained, and they're so conscientious to make sure that your money that you donate is going where it's supposed to be, that everything is accounted for, that every T is crossed, that every I is dotted. And that's a big thing that Darlene is, she, she gives to our church in lots of ways. But if you appreciate what they're doing for us, let them know. It's a lot. Um, Adrian you know what, we canceled potlucks a few months because we had no one to take the lead. And in a conversation with Adrian, she said, I'll do it. And I know she hasn't been the only one, and, and sometimes I think she's just getting trained in, but we're having potlucks. And she, she wasn't even, she didn't even know about our church a year ago, and she has just jumped in. I'm proud of her. And I appreciate that she's willing to serve in our church when she found a spot that she thought that she could help in. She's not able to today for today's potluck because she's sick too. But let Adrian know how much you appreciate her. It would mean a lot, I'm sure. Um, just two more. Jim, who uh, didn't, didn't want to possibly expose us, even though he doesn't have COVID, um, or at least not as of yesterday, <laughs> He, he has done a lot for our church over the years. I don't think anybody has done more. Maybe I'm wrong. But he's done so much for our church building and electrical and any other time, big projects, little projects, just need attention to one thing. Jim has done that for a number of decades. And he's still serving our church. And so he's another one. I mean, I'm going to leave people off the list. I just picked people that weren't here to shrink the list a little. But the idea is, friends, pe people I'm not naming too, let them know that you appreciate their ministry to this church. Give them some encouragement. To, because it, when we're appreciated, we want to give some more, don't we? And, and it just feels good. And so let's share our appreciation. Pastor James... He uh, helps with the Youth Connect. He helps with AV. He's been in this build in the church during the week many times, working on the AV system to tweak it, to improve it, um, including this week. Remember, we had one monitor down. Um, 
Now we don't, right? And so Pastor James and, uh, and a few others came here and helped. And so what, let's just encourage one another. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Amen. That's what God is wanting us to do, to build each other up. It's not flattery. It's encouragement. Hebrews 10.25, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Tougher times are coming. We need to be there for each other and build each other up. Don't you think? Hebrews 3.13, last one, but encourage one another every day. Are we doing that every day? I'm not. <laughs> The Bible says, encourage one another every day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that is especially spiritual encouragement. And so, uh, can we do maybe a little more than we've done? Probably all of us can. Let's be a church full of encouragers. Before the message, let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for evidence of your work around us, on the, on the internet. Your work extends everywhere. We thank you again for your work in Daniel and Krista's life. And we want you to work in the few moments that we're going to be opening your word. Lord, work on our hearts right now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I look at the news, there have been three big topics. I'm going to hit one, sort of. Big topic this week was school shooting, wasn't it? Terrible, terrible. Another big thing that's been in the news is the Ukrainian war, right? Ukraine and Russia war, terrible. And another thing that's been in the news a lot is the possibility of overturning Roe versus Wade and the possibility of ending at least on a federal level um, the right to an abortion to then leave it up to the states to make that decision and my sermon today isn't going to be about abortion but it's simply an illustration that I want to use when does life begin? Where does life even come from? In Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, it says that God formed us in the womb, doesn't it? And in Leviticus chapter 17, Verses, well, let me go. I want to read. You've got it on the screen, don't you? <laughs> oh, we'll read it. We'll follow along. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So who put us together before anybody ever saw us? God did. He was knitting us in the womb. He was acquainted with you before anyone else was. And in um, Leviticus chapter 17, and in Leviticus 17, verses 11 and 14, the Bible tells us, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And... 14, I'm sorry. For life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Do you know how early a newly growing baby in the womb has its own blood? About 22 days, its heart is beating. And the heart is beating its own blood, not the mama's blood. Because the baby can have a different blood type than the mom, can't it? its own blood. And the Bible's telling us that the life is in the blood. There is life. There is life. Even mere days after conception. 
And that life, where does it come from? It's what God has done, right? We get to see life out of the womb, that first breath, that first cry, as it's so thrilling for parents and grandparents and, and everyone, so thrilling. But before that moment of birth, God was giving life, even though it wasn't seen. Amen. And so that, to me, is a good illustration for what the Bible talks about is being born again. In, in John chapter 3, verse 5, what does the Bible tell us? John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We have to be born of the water and the Spirit, and that is something that we saw today physically, didn't we? But just like a physical birth is not the start of the life, really, that life had started previously. We just witnessed what God has done today, but he was already at work in their lives. Before you and I really make a decision for Christ, how do we even get to that point? We get there because God has been at work in an unseen way. He has already been at work. Our spiritual life started by God before we even realized it, before we were born again. And birth leads to growth. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It tells us about the growth that, we sh that God wants to see in us. But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready. So there's an expectation here that the Apostle Paul had that there would be a maturity amongst the believers, and he's letting them know you haven't grown up. You're kind of stuck in this juvenile stage. And God wants you to mature. He wants you to handle the meat. He wants you to handle the deeper stuff. He wants you to mature. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, we are told something that will pretty much be the theme of today's message. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. And the Bible tells us, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So as you have received life from God, spiritual life, continue walking so God who gave it to you will continue to give it to you, friends. And he wants us to walk this life of faith. Amen. God can grow us and God can mature us, can't he? Amen. It's his desire and what he wants to do. If we allow him to do it, we will grow, we will mature. And how do we grow? We're going to get into that. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21 the Bible gives us some further instruction. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. I love this is God's promise. Now may the God of peace who brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. So once we become born again, it is God's plan that he does something in you. It's his plan not so much for you to do something in him. We can't. But for him to do something in you and in me. He wants to equip you, it says in verse 21, for everything that is good. Who's equipping who? Are you equipping yourself? This verse is saying that God will equip you. And that you may do his will. He's working in us to do what is pleasing to him. You want to please God? Is that started in your heart? God is the one that will help you to actually do that. To please him. And it comes through Jesus Christ. And to him be the glory. Because of what he is doing. And friends I think that we'll give God a whole lot more glory. When we realize 
how helpless we are and how great He is and what He's doing in our life. In the transformation, not from our grunting and groaning, but our transformation because of what God is doing in our lives. In John 15, Jesus gives um, an object lesson. In John 15, and I'll pick just a couple verses. I am the true vine, verse 1, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. You know what I love? I love this word, abide. Other versions say remain. And so this is letting us know who attached us to the vine. Who did that? Did you attach yourself to the vine? No, this was God's work. God was doing the, is the one who attached you and me to the vine. So now he's just telling us, remain. Remain attached to me. You don't have to work hard to be attached. I already did it. I was at work in your life. I've attached you to myself. Simply abide. Amen. Simply remain connected to me. He's saying, don't leave. I worked hard to get you connected to me. Don't leave. Stick with me. And as we stay attached to the vine, the vine is feeding us, right? The vine is where the nutrients comes from. The vine is providing the life and what we need for life. And that's what Jesus says he'll do. He is the source of life. He's got it going and he keeps it going. Amen? What we see him start, he will finish. Without Jesus, it says, we can do nothing. Because we don't have any life in and of ourselves. We don't have any sustaining nutrients to keep us alive and keep us going. As we receive Christ by His doing, not ours, we receive Christ by His doing, He got it started, that's what He wants to continue in us. That we keep receiving, keep receiving, keep receiving Him in what He wants to give us. And I have a quote that I don't have in my notes. So I'm going to come down, kind of embarrassed, and I'm going to read it with you. I tell you what, this book, Steps to Christ, is one of my absolute favorites. And Krista and Daniel, don't leave. You've got one. This is one of yours. And uh, you both have one here, as well as a baptism certificate. And I'm just going to share a couple of quotes I love. There's a chapter called Growing in Christ. If you have that book, read this chapter. I think it's one of the best chapters and one of the best books. It says here, The plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. The child cannot by any anxiety or power of its own add to its stature. Zeke, can you get taller if you try hard? No, even Zeke gets this. <laughs> and so, Zeke, no kid can, can just decide to grow. No more can you, by anxiety or effort of yourself, secure spiritual growth. Well, that can be discouraging just right there by itself, but God has a plan. The plant, the child, grows by receiving from its surroundings that which ministers to its life air, sunshine, and food. What these gifts of nature are to animal and plants, so is who? So is Christ to those who trust in Him. And so just like kids can't make themselves grow, you can't grow yourself. And so give it up if that's what you're trying to do. And turn your eyes to Jesus. He's the one to give you everything that you need. God provides the roots to soak up everything that you need to. Um, next quote. It says, this is from Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. It's a long race. It's a lifelong race or a race till Jesus comes. It's long. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, 
the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Next, it continues. Because of the joy awaiting him. Hold on. Because, oh, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Amen. Then you won't become weary and give up. I like the way the New Living Translation words that. As we remember what Christ has done for us, that will keep us going on this race of endurance. And let's go to the next slide. I like this. You are just as dependent upon Christ in order to live a holy life as is the branch upon the parent stock for growth and fruitfulness. That's what Jesus talked about in John 15. Apart from him, you have what? No life. We are totally dependent on Jesus Christ, aren't we? But sometimes we don't live that way. We live like we're dependent on ourselves. Give it up. <laughs> it doesn't work. Depend on Him. You have no power to resist temptation or to grow in grace and holiness. Abiding in Him, you may what? You may flourish. Who wants to flourish? Drawing your life from Him, you will not wither nor be fruitless. Drawing our life from who? From Jesus. For us to grow to be like Him is His work that we simply receive. And then we can, our souls can be still, can't we? Because we're at rest, trusting Him. Next one. Again, Colossians 2, 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, which was by faith, which was by His work, so walk in Him. Continue by faith and by His work inside of you. That's the way it keeps on going. Let's go again. So, how do we abide? How do we grow? One is to put your faith in Christ, in Him, in Him completely. Sometimes we're like partially having faith in Christ and partially in someone else or in ourselves. The real way to grow is Jesus and putting our faith 100% in Him to finish what He started. Romans 1 verse 17. Well, we'll go with, maybe I didn't have it. Philippians 1 6. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He's sure, he's confident, and that's what you and I need to have too. For us to grow, we need to have assurance, be confident in that God can finish what he started. Sometimes our confidence gets weak because we see how, how much we mess up, and we get discouraged, and we wonder, when are we ever going to get our act together? And we can lose trust and, and faith in what God will do. But he said, we can be assured, what he starts, he can finish. Amen? In spite of you and me, you never started your life and you aren't going to sustain your life. Jesus started it, he'll sustain it. He can complete it in spite of us and our weaknesses. So how do we abide? By faith by faith in what he has promised to do. Let's go to the next slide. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that's the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by what? By faith. That is our life. Faith not in us. Faith completely and fully in Jesus. In what he will do. And I have another quote. Many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin. But now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. Anybody, anybody fit that category at some point in their life? That's me, I know. Every such effort must fail. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. 
Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness all depend on our union, our connection with Christ. It is by communion with Him daily, hourly, by abiding in Him, just yeah, that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. Amen? It's not Christ first, you second, and Him at the end. <laughs> it's Him first and last and always. We can trust Him. And then the next thing. Well, therefore, as you see Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. And number two, how do we abide and grow? We trust Christ completely. Not just a little bit, but we trust Him completely. Sometimes trusting Him is easier said than done. Let's look at the next verse. When the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ the source of strength in life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion, the abiding of the soul with Christ. And listen to what can turn our eyes away from Christ. The pleasures of the world, life's cares and perplexities and sorrows. Anybody have any of those this week? Cares, perplexities, sorrows. The faults of others, or your own faults and imperfections. I bet we've all looked in the mirror this week in one way or another and seen some of those. To any or all of these, he will seek to divert the mind. It's not about us. Our eyes need to be on Jesus and on what he can do. Next. In James, this is where the trust <laughs> is a challenge. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be what? Perfect, or another word for that is mature. That you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So if Jesus is the one to make us mature, and we can't do it ourselves, we just found out one of the methods that he uses. Trials. Hallelujah. You have a trial lately. Praise the Lord. That's God's method to help you mature. Now how many of you want to mature? That's why trusting Him sometimes can be a challenge. Because He can lead us down a path where like, God, where did you go? Why am I here? It's hard. I thought you were supposed to make life easier. And He's saying, I am. I'm teaching you a lesson that's going to make your life a whole lot better. And so part of growing in Him is to trust Him in what He sees to do in our life. And He wants us to not separate ourselves. Let's go to the next one. Surrender. How do we grow? We surrender. Surrender to the trial that God wants to take us through. We surrender to Him in whatever He wants in our life. And surrender for you and me is not an easy thing. Or am I wrong about you and only right about me? It can be hard, but if we want to grow, God is going to take us down a path that some days we might not want to go, and we can say, okay, Lord, it's fine. It's okay. I trust you. I know you're just trying to help mature me. I want that too. Go ahead. It is okay. We can't grow without surrender. That is an important part. And then next. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. I just want you to remember, as you receive the life that He gave, keep walking in that life that He will continue to give you. 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Oh, pastor, why did it was good until now. <laughs> if we're going to grow in Christ, we need to count the cost. To grow as a Christian, to mature as a Christian, costs us something. And Jesus makes no bones about it. He says, if you're not willing to give up mom and dad and brother and sister and grandma and grandpa, now I added a few, but most of those were in there. You're not worthy of me. He wants us to count the cost. And he says, it's going to cost you something. 
to be what I want you to be in a world that opposes me, what else could we expect, right? It, it didn't like Jesus, and if we are his followers and we're being like him, what can we expect? And instead of it being something that we are frustrated about, it's a badge of honor. To be persecuted is a badge of honor because the devil doesn't persecute his own. Amen? He, he, he persecutes those who are on God's side. So if you're being persecuted, it's evidence that God is growing you. Amen? Bring it... Oh, I was going to say bring it on. No, seriously. Lord, bring it on. It's okay. Show me the evidence that you're working in my life. And if it's persecution because my family doesn't understand me, my spouse doesn't understand me, because I want to follow you, they think that I'm crazy, it's all right. It's okay. I am growing in Jesus, and this is where God has led me, and I can be okay with this. Accept the cost. And sometimes you may feel alone, but that's why we need a church family where other people that have accepted the cost can be together and we can encourage each other to continue even though we might be going through a trial and our decision to follow Jesus yesterday may cost us something today. We need to come together and we need to encourage each other. And Jesus is saying, don't pull away from me. Abide in me, even if life gets hard. And so, friends, God doesn't abort any of his children, amen? Some of us are, seem like we're born walking the wrong way, and God can see that, and he doesn't abort anyone. Everyone comes, physic, comes to term physically, everyone that man doesn't intervene with or doesn't stop through abortion, Everyone will come because of God's design, will come to full term. He is striving with every person to conceive in them the seeds of spiritual life. And he's done that in everybody here, or you wouldn't be here. He's conceived new spiritual life in you. And he has connected us to himself. He just says to us today, friends, to abide. Do you want to? Do you want to abide? Do you want to be connected to Jesus? Do you want to say, do you know what? I'm not going to look at myself. I just got that good advice not to look at myself, not to look at others, but look to Jesus. He is the one that will finish the work. He is the one that will get us ready for his return. He is the one that will have us ready to look up in the clouds and say, my God has come for me. Amen, amen, amen. And then we'll get to meet face to face with the one who started our life and has continued our life to completion. And I know what we're going to do. We're going to bow at his feet and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for continuing the life, for growing me. Every day we get to decide whether or not we will remain or abide in him. So today, what do you want to decide? Will you trust Jesus to finish what he started in you? Or as you have received Christ for salvation, do you want to continue to receive from him for the growth that you need, that he wants in your life? As you have received Christ, yes, we want to continue that from birth to maturity. So today, how many of you want to say, God, I want to abide in you. God, I want to be connected with you. I don't want to look at myself. I want to look to Jesus. That's what he wants, and that's what makes him happy when we say and we choose to continue to abide in him. Let's pray for God to mature us today. Father in heaven, Lord, all of us here are at different points, but none of us are fully mature like Jesus was. And so I ask that you would move on us. You've started a work. And Lord, bring it to full maturity, that this church would be full of, of Christians who are not babes just taking milk, but that they can handle the deeper stuff from your word. Lord, maybe there's some here that uh, haven't been growing that much. Maybe they at least feel like that. Please, Lord, encourage them today that they can trust you, that they can 
Be still in their soul and not perplexed because you are at work and you will do your work in their life. Lord, may we trust you completely to take us to maturity, to grow us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.